Morning, everyone. Good to see all of you on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. And I hope that, as always, our time spent together in all that we do will be, will have been uh, profitable for us, that we will have used this time to the glory of God uh, in every way. For those of you that are uh, looking in from uh, parts unknown out there, uh, uh, welcome uh, to you, and, uh, and I hope that you uh, be, have been uplifted and continue to be through our service that we offer uh, to the Lord today. Uh, now, before I get into the lesson, uh, I want you to understand that uh, often when I'm deciding on what to preach on, I rely upon uh, intuition. Intuition is not always correct, uh, but I, I kind of feel like Jude when sometimes when he said I felt the necessity to write uh, concerning you know what you know what he was talking about there. So sometimes as I'm thinking about and praying about uh, what I'm going to be speaking on, uh, something will come uh, and I'll feel like it's really important to deal with. Uh, and so this morning we're going to be talking about uh, building a strong congregation and what that means and what that looks like. And in fact, we're going to have some lessons that are going to be dealing specifically uh, with this and what a strong congregation uh, looks like. Uh, I think that my motivation for this, uh, probably the reason this came to me is uh, because as things progress and uh, I'm really get, becoming hopeful that uh, as time goes on, it won't be too long before the pandemic will be uh, behind us and we'll be able to live our lives uh, as we're ac accustomed to living them. And given the fact that not just this congregation, but congregations all over the place uh, are not congregating in the fullest sense of the word. And so when these things begin to pass and we're able to come together, uh, what is our view of a, ourselves as a congregation? It's kind of hard to maintain that. At least I would think it would be a challenge if we're not congregating, right? And so let's start reminding ourselves of what the Lord says about a congregation and what a strong congregation is and what a weak congregation is. And we'll talk about uh, that here a bit this morning. So we'll just see how far we get. That's kind of how it is today. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to start uncovering some things that will uh, be, of valuable, be of value to us as we go here. So I want to start out with some questions. And first of all, have you ever or have you given any thought as to whether uh, you or not you believe that you are a member of a strong congregation? Okay. Of course, it's important for us to assemble together. We all understand that. And most of us, if we're going to assemble uh, with God's people, we want to assemble with a, with a group that is strong. Okay? But the question is, uh, what exactly does that mean? Uh, what exactly is a strong congregation? And if you believe that you are a member of one, on what do you base that belief? All right, so we want to talk about some things that will help to answer some of these questions uh, and, and hopefully get our minds focused, refocused, uh, focused in a better way than ever upon uh, who we are as a congregation and, and, what, and what these things really mean. Now, we know that in the Bible there are lots of congregations that are talked about. Some of those congregations are good. I mean, they're, they're strong. They're, however we are going to define that, they're, they're, they're doing really well, and, and others, uh, not so much. Okay. Other congregations that we read about in the Bible uh, are, you know, have certain struggles. And so, really, when we think about the, the Bible teaching when it comes to uh, congregations then, uh, let's look at, uh, for instance, the, the letters to the churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. And I'll look at this one because it's bigger. Uh, and, and I'm not going to go through all these, obviously. But what it is showing is that 
these, congreg these congregations represent uh, all the problems, the good things that can happen within a congregation. And so, for instance, uh, the uh, Church of Philadelphia, and I'm just concentrating on commendations and condemnations right now. Uh, the Church of Philadelphia, uh, the Lord, uh, or excuse me, at La Laodicea, he had no commendation. He didn't have anything good to say about them. You know, they thought they were alive, but they were dead. They didn't know that they were poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. He didn't have a good thing to say about them. And he always said something good if he could before he said something negative. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we look at the congregations like, like Smyrna and Philadelphia, uh, he had no condemnation for them. Uh, everything that he said uh, to them was, was positive. And so there's a whole gambit of things here uh, that he says with regard to these congregations. Uh, and so what we want to do is to look at ourselves as a congregation and maybe think about where we would be uh, here on this, on this chart. What kind of things would the Lord say to us as a congregation? Uh, he spoke of the, uh, the, the lampstands and the lampstands uh, you know, representing the congregation. And so how, is our, how are we? Uh, what kind of condition are we in? So yes, this is going to entail some self-examination. And I also realize that congregations are made up of people, individuals. And so in some ways, it's really hard to, to extricate the individual from the group because the group is made up of individuals. All right. And, but we, we, we do have a congregational identity just as they did. And so we want to take an opportunity to examine that. And take a good look at that. Now, churches like Corinth, for instance, uh, they had problems. You know, they were divided up over preachers. They allowed sin to exist within their number, in their congregation. Uh, they uh, were taking each other to court. Uh, they were kind of divisive when it came to spiritual gifts. You know, people wanted to speak in tongues, and that was the big one. And Paul had to, had to deal with that. Uh, and, and there's other congregations, as we point out here, that, that we're doing better there. And so what we want to start out doing here this morning is I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a, a, some characteristics of a weak congregation. Now, I put that in quotations, and I really need to put strong in quotations because uh, I'm giving you some, some ideas, some suggestions of my own. You may have some of your own uh, that's completely different from mine. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that there are things that can exist amongst us just as amongst New Testament congregations uh, that are good and some things that are not so good as far as our, our uh, identity as a congregation. All right, so we're going to take a look here for a moment at some characteristics that I'll call of a, of a weak uh, congregation. All right, so one of those is lack of trust in the Bible. Now, in Matthew 7, Jesus said there, anyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be compared to a foolish man, etc. Now, why would someone hear the words of Jesus as he spoke and or the, were his words through the Holy Spirit uh, as revealed through his apostles, why would we hear those words and not act upon them? Do you suppose, as I do, that there may be a trust issue there? You know, in 1 Thessalonians 2, of course, I had Kymel read from 1 Thessalonians 1 to just show, well, here's a real strong congregation. Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, Paul had said that he was thankful uh, for, the, uh, for the Thessalonians for certain reasons. I want you to look here at what he says. I want to make sure that, um, that I'm getting the right passage here because sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. But 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, in verse 13,
He says, for this reason also, we constantly thank God that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you uh, accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. So we saw that they, from 1 Thessalonians 1, that's, that was a pretty good congregation. Uh, lots of commendations, uh, praises for them from the apostle. And so they were a people who had accepted the word as the word of God. Do, so the, the question is, do we trust that this is the word of God? Do we, what do you think about that? Did God make sure that his word was preserved for us so that we have his word? Do we have translations of his word that, that are reliable? I'm not talking about, you know, paraphrases are thought for thought. Translations are word for word. So paraphrases, I don't study from paraphrases. Sometimes I'll look at one to, out of curiosity to see how someone expressed the thought. But, my, but the question is, do we have confidence that we have translations of God's word that give us what he wants us to have? Do we have that trust? What about the canonicity of the Bible? The canon means a, a measuring rod or a measuring reed. And so there were uh, criteria by which people accepted the New Testament books, in our case, as, as inspired. Uh, do, we, do we believe that we have uh, the inspired word of God? Okay. Do we have the books of the Bible that God wants us to have? Do we have confidence in that? Okay. Now, these are important questions. Uh, does the Bible or is the Bible understandable? Is it possible for us to, to read and understand like Paul says, when you, know, when you read, you may understand my insight into the mystery of Christ? Do we have confidence in that? Does the Bible provide all things that pertain to life and godliness uh, as Peter claims it does? And so trust in the Bible is a real big one. And there is a, uh, uh, quite a movement in the land of people who are religious people, you know, people with suits and ties on or robes or whatever it is uh, that are teaching people that you can't trust the Bible. And so that's a big deal. I'm not going to get into that because that'll take away too much time from the lesson. But, but do we as a congregation trust the Bible? Do we, do we trust it? And a question that kind of follows along with that then uh, is... Just a minute, just a second here. There we go. All right. Another characteristic of a weak congregation is lack of personal Bible study. Now, I use 2 Timothy 1.5 because he uses the word diligence for this reason, applying all diligence, add to your faith, moral excellence, etc. And so, and he ends that section there, be diligent, you know, to be sure of his calling and choosing you. So this idea of being diligent, of being, you know, on top of things, not lagging behind in diligence. And so lack of personal Bible study can result in a, what, we're, what I'm calling a weak congregation. Okay. The Bereans, as you will recall, in Acts 17, search the scriptures daily to see whether these things that were being preached to them by the apostles were so. Yeah. They searched the scriptures daily to see. I mean, it may not even necessarily be that you want to see. I mean, I, I hope that you, will, you can see, are free to see if what I'm saying is so. <laughs> you are certainly... But what about what you already believe? Is that so? Are you sure that what you already believe is in line with the word of God? And if there's any possibility that you haven't arrived, <laughs> is it worthwhile to search the scriptures to see, to examine your own beliefs? Yeah. And so 
Paul's told the Ephesians, you, in, in Ephesians 5, says, For you were formerly darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Well, how do you try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord? <laughs> you got to look and see what he says. What does he say is pleasing to him? So if we have a congregation of people who do not study their Bible personally, that's going to result in a weak congregation. Now we can go on to this one. A weak congregation is persuadable by men. In Romans 16 here, he talks about uh, people who are servants not of God, but of their own appetite and by their, their uh, smooth and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Jesus tells us in Matthew 15 and verse 9 that told them that they worshiped him in vain as he quoted the prophet Isaiah, teaching his doctrines, the precepts of men. No, first Corinthians 3.21, you did not put your, you know, start regarding man or, or stop putting your trust in men. The Bible is, is replete with passages that tell us don't put our trust in men. But, but if we're persuadable by men because we're unsuspecting, because we don't study the Bible, we don't know what the Word says, and somebody can come and tell us things that are not in line with God and persuade us. That's a weak congregation. In fact, the leaders, the elders of a congregation are supposed to be able to refute false doctrine. And there's a reason for that. Because sometimes by some means, especially in our day, with... <coughs> information available from in so many ways and are being bombarded by it every single day. It's especially important that we understand what the will of God is so that we can know what is not the will of God. And no matter who says it, who teaches it, that we're able to see it for what it is and not be persuaded by people. It's amazing to me as I read about the things that people try to put forth and questioning the Bible and, and these kind of things. And I just, I just always, you know, it's just me, but I just think, you know, we're all going to be dead. What are you going to do then? What are you going to do when you leave this world? Where's all your philosophy and your reasonings and your rejection of plain statements by God? What are you going to do with it then? And I don't know, people like me, you know, may be dinosaurs, and maybe there's going to come a point where, you know, we're all gone, and everybody's just doing what they want to do, and, and uh, I hope not, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's deplorable what's going on. But anyway, so a weak congregation persuadable by men and seeking something new, something new, it takes us back to our Bible class this morning in Israel and uh, wanting the king like the nations around them. You know, they don't want to keep doing it the same old way and you know, got with God ruling over them and uh, seeking something new. And if you put, if you take Galatians 1, 8, and 9 and kind of squeeze them together, you have whether it's any man or we, Paul said referring to himself, or an angel from heaven preaches to you a gospel contrary to that which you have received, uh, let him be accursed. And the thing about it is that if we don't look to the Bible, to God, for guidance, what's left? What's left? The only thing that's left is men. Remember Jesus in Matthew 21, 25 asked that when he was asked the baptism of John, is it from heaven or from men? 
When he asked that of those people who were questioning him, they didn't want to answer the question. But the point is, he only recognized two possible sources. It's either from heaven or it's from man. So if I'm looking for something new, then that means heaven must have something new to offer. But wait. One of the things that's kind of cool that we're doing here is that as we're studying our Bibles and we're, we're studying the Old Testament and thinking and rethinking, uh, we always, oh, every week we come together, we comment on how we're seeing things in the Bible that we never saw before. I mean, they're old, but they're also new, right? Because we didn't see them before. And so that's great. New understanding, you know, is, is wonderful. But something new outside of the revealed will of God, that's not so wonderful. And so if we want to try to find something new, some new way, some, the new Christianity as it's called, that's a problem. And that weakens a congregation. So trying to find something new, and then, of course, seeking popularity. In Galatians 1 and verse 10, Paul says, For am I seeking to please God or men? And he says in the latter part of that verse, if I were still, and I thought that was interesting, something I kind of went over my head all these years, if I were still trying to please men, which means at one point he was trying to please men. And he says, if I were still trying to please men, you know, I just want to stay with that one for some reason. <laughs> That's just, you know, fascinates when you look at Paul's life and the things that he was doing and the violence that he brought against God's people. And how sure he was. And all the while, part of that or the motivation behind that was trying to please men. But he said, if, I, if I'm still trying to please men, then I'm not a bondservant of Christ. You can't serve two masters, can you? And so we're either going to strive to please God or strive to please men. I think it's remarkable that in John 12, that even some of the rulers were believing in him. You know, people who had a lot to lose were believing in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him. Because they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. They weren't confessing him, he says, lest they be put out of, this, out of the synagogue. And so they didn't want to confess Christ. Well, what did Jesus say will happen to individuals who will not confess him before men? He won't confess them. Before God and before the angels of God, he won't confess you. And why wouldn't they? Because they feared men. They wanted, they wanted the approval of men. Woe to you, Jesus said, when all men speak well of you. For their fathers treated the false prophets in this way. So seeking popularity and then, of course, wanting to have their ears tickled or having itching ears. Paul said they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn away from the truth and be turned aside to myths. Okay. So if we want someone that's only going to teach what makes us comfortable, remember the old preachers used to say that we preach to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That was, a, that was a Richard Tucker one, as a matter of fact. <laughs> you know, comfort the affliction and afflict the comfortable. Well, look, 
I'm not up here with the express purpose of afflicting you, but the word of God will afflict you sometimes. And so if having our ears tickle and just listening to things that are pleasant to us is what we're after, then we have a problem. There's a passage that occurs to me from Isaiah chapter 30. And of course, we know they were, the people were in big trouble back at this time. The prophet writes, for this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, now they're not going to listen to the Lord, but they want to listen to man. And here's what they say, who say to the seers, you must not see visions. And to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words, prophesy illusions. Lie to us. It's okay. okay. Speak pleasant words. We want to feel good. We want to feel justified. Uh, we want to feel okay about things. So don't preach to us the truth. Because sometimes the truth hurts or it is demanding. We don't want to hear that. Well, if that's the kind of congregation we are, then we're a weak congregation. So if, it's a, so if it's a lack of, of Bible study, being persuaded by men, popularity, wanting to have our ears tickled, those are the kinds of things that indicate a weak congregation. Uh, I don't know that I'd want to be part of one like that. And I'm sure you probably don't either. So then what are some of the foundations of a strong congregation? Well, let's take a look at, at that question. And in order to do so, I want to start out by taking us over to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. <clears throat> Just do a little Ephesians work here for a moment to illustrate the fact that the Apostle Paul and Jesus were in, a, in agreement uh, as to uh, what he wanted from us as a congregation. Okay. Uh, first of all, to be grounded in the truth, verses, uh, beginning at verse 11, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So he wants us to be grounded. A strong congregation is going to be grounded. Not only that, but growing, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. He wants us to be working from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of what? Each individual part. That's you and that's me as part of the body. And then for us to be strong, as I interpret for the last part of this, as the last part of this passage, for the building up of itself in love, to be a self-edifying body. Those are the things that the Lord uh, wants for us as a congregation. And so what has to be in place is the question in order for us to measure up to the strength and fidelity and vitality of the strong amongst the churches that we read about in the New Testament. What are some things that have to be in place? Because we're going to be talking about uh, five uh, measures, if you will, of a strong congregation. Not today, but going forward. Five things that really show a congregation is strong, but there are certain things that have to be in place in order for that to occur. So let's talk a little bit about what some of those things might be. Well, uh, first of all, 
spiritual leadership. Okay? Spiritual leadership. Uh, leadership is influence. I mean, if you can't, if you don't have influence over people, you can't lead them. So it's the ability of one person to influence others. It's, it's you know, leadership is a quality. Not everybody has that quality. Not everybody naturally looks to everybody else as a leader. That's why, you know, my friend Lowell Williams used to say, only appoint elders if you have to, because somebody's feelings always get hurt. Because not everyone is looked to. Not everybody has that intangible quality about them that people have confidence in them as leaders. It's just, you know, we're not all made the same or made to do the same thing. So if we're going to be a strong congregation, we need to have spiritual leaders and people that inspire confidence. Because that's part of being scripturally organized as per God's design. And so spiritual leadership is really important. And listen, true spiritual leadership is not about being served, doing what I tell you to do, serving me. It is about serving. I mean, when you think about it, the, it's not the office of overseer that is a fine work. It is the function of overseeing that is a fine work, right? And so spiritual leaders is very, very important. Now, uh, here's a, a, a quote, and I'm going to read it to you uh, from over here because I can see it. But this is a quote. don't remember where I got it from, but that's often true. But this is a pretty good one. Spiritual authority and leadership is not won by promotion, but by many t uh, prayers and tears. It is attained by confessions of sin and much heart searching and humbling before God, by self-surrender, a courageous sacrifice of every idol, a bold, deathless, uncompromising, and uncomplaining embrace of the cross, and by an eternal, unfaltering looking unto Jesus crucified. It is not gained by seeking great things that are uh, for ourselves, but rather like Paul, by counting those things that are gained to be lost for Christ. That is a great price, but it must be unflinchingly paid by him who would not merely be a nominal, but a real spiritual leader of men, a leader whose power is felt and recognized in heaven uh, and on earth. So spiritual leadership. Not only spiritual leadership, but also a disciplined membership. The first nine verses of Hebrews chapter 12 presents the argument that hardships or difficulties should not be looked upon it by God's people as discouraging, but encouraging because when we receive discipline, then we show that we are legitimate sons uh, of God, that we are part of his family because he scourges every son whom he receives. Discipline is part of life. Going through hardship and being faithful to God shows that we belong to him. And so God disciplines us uh, in love to correct, to purify, to train, to structure his children's lives according to his wishes, either through perseverance under trial and or by our receiving his word and applying it to our lives. So we, with that spiritual leadership, must also be disciplined members. Okay? Disciplined members uh, under the regulation uh, and control uh, of God. You know, in Hebrews 5, he, we have that passage where he says, well, although by this time you should be teachers, but you need, have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and he goes on. But the point that I want to make here is where he says that the mature are those who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And the reason why these Hebrew Christians uh, were unaccustomed to the word of God as he spoke of was because they had failed to practice and to train. They weren't disciplined. They had been Christians long enough that if they had been disciplined members, they would be teaching others. 
but they were still babes in Christ because of a lack of discipline and a lack of practice and a lack of training, you see. And so discipline or righteous, righteousness, I should say, involves habit, patterns of behavior, patterns of righteousness are only established by consistent training and practice. So a strong congregation is one that learns obedience because of practice. Everything else you want to be good at, you practice at, right? Well, living a righteous life is the same way. You practice it. Look for opportunities to manifest that in your life and practice. That's the discipline. That's being a practicing Christian. <laughs> we hear about practicing Catholics or non-practicing Catholics. We're not, we're not practicing. We are practicing Christians. And you practice things to get better at it. And you grow with respect to salvation and you, you grow in likeness of Christ by practice. And so the exhortation, you know, it wasn't easy for Christ, wasn't easy for us. So the exhortation of Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, uh, stand firm or be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Okay. It wasn't easy for Jesus. It's not going to be easy for us. But if we're going to be a congregation uh, that is considered uh, strong by the Lord, our lampstand is, is shining, uh, then that's what we're going to have to do. And then last but not least, a sanctified membership. We understand sanctification, you know, to be set apart. But what does it look like? It's more than just learning what the Bible teaches. What sanctification looks like is personal change. And so to resign ourselves to the idea that you cannot change for the better is completely unscriptural. Because Paul wrote through the Holy Spirit, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Over the course of our life, we are being renewed day by day. We are learning. We are growing. We are deepening. And for anybody to say that's not possible, they're telling you a lie. It is possible, or God wouldn't hold us to it. And so, for, so we, our goal is to grow into the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. We are called uh, Paul said in, in, in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, we are called uh, by his gospel to sanctification by the Spirit, listen, and faith in the truth. That takes us right back to our first point about a weak congregation lacking that. Okay. Faith in the sanctification and faith in the truth. So, with spiritual leaders... Discipline members and a congregation that is ready and willing to experience biblical change and growth, then we can be found to be a congregation that is grounded and growing and working and strong. And so from here, we're going to look at some things that are the measure. You know, they use the word a lot these days, the, the metrics, right? Where are, what are the metrics of a, of a strong congregation? What does that look like? And that's what we're going to be examining so that we can examine ourselves so that as we, more and more of us, begin to come back and congregate together and finally we're at our full bloom and growing once again, uh, then we can be a congregation that anybody would want to be a part of. If we're growing spiritually, we'll grow numerically. And so that's our prayer, that we be productive for the Lord here in this place. If you are within the sound of my voice this morning, uh, I hope that there, you have heard something that has pricked your heart, that has uh, encouraged you uh, to want to be a better servant of God. If you need the prayers of this congregation, uh, let that be known. Anybody that's here, anybody that's out there, 
Uh, if, you, if you need instruction, you want to know more about being a Christian, then we are here to help you with that uh, anytime, anytime that you need to. So thank you so much, and onward and upward. Okay. Thank you. Let's stand and sing our closing song.